So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history uh, and the species which we've got in Australia. Then I'll talk about um, these um, two new spring active species, which um, we are introducing around across southern Australia. And Loane, have a look at this, please. Um, and um, control of gut worms and then right. benefits and a bit about biochar. Australia used to have a, a heap of megafauna, um, you know, things like the one on the top left-hand corner that's a diprotodon and that, you know, it's a huge um, sort of wombat-like thing um, uh, and uh, they produced big amounts of crap, of course, and, of course, associated with those were large dung beetles. But um, the uh, megafauna was uh, sent extinct um, 20, 15 to 26,000 years ago and so um, with the extinction of those beetles, with the extinction of the megafauna also went the very large beetles. So um, when uh, Governor Philip arrived in Australia, um, uh, the, um, he brought with him um, a, a brand new kind of ecological paradigm, if you like. Um, over, so in the past 200 years, we've, we've had a new system established across Australia. We've got new mammals, we've got new gut parasites, new grasses, legumes, and of course the woodlands were cleared and we've got new earthworms and uh, new microbes. But um, of course, um, like I was saying earlier, the um, dung beetles which were adapted to dealing with large heaps of, uh, of dung um, were not present because they'd gone extinct. So there are only native dung beetles present and they weren't much good at burying cow dung. So um, around the world, there are about 9,000 species. And there are, although there are 400 native species in Australia, but only a few of these use domestic stock, stock dung. And, um, and they're not very reliable. You know, they, they come and they go um, with the seasons and um, with different years. And so um, this, this picture that you can see on the, on the right there, um, that was typical of, of Australia uh, 40 years ago. 50 years ago before we started introducing dung beetles. So I was with CSIRO and we introduced dung beetles to Australia. There you can see Bubis bison, a winter active dung beetle. And um, it, it, has, has, it achieves a whole series of things. So there's pest control and there are also a heap of production and environmental benefits actually, which I haven't listed here, which I should have. Um, but there are flies, I'll deal with fly control in a minute. Um, then I'll tell you about the, um, the new species that we're going to bring in uh, and the new species that we have brought in and are uh, attempting to spread across southern Australia. A bit about gut parasites, uh, gut parasites of livestock, and then some uh, production benefits, so the, the way, in which earth work, way in which the dung beetles actually do their work and the way in which they achieve the benefits that we uh, see, and then a bit about um, biochar and carbon storage in the soil. So that's the um, order for the day. Um, so now, oops. There we are. Um, so the CSIRO dung beetle program, um, really there are three phases to it. The first was a very big and long one cost in, in which we brought in 23 species. Now it's really important to appreciate that uh, only a, um, less than half of the beetles we brought in we managed to establish. So um, we, um, there were some that were bred up in the laboratory, 20 of them, and they were released into the field, but they never established. And there were 12 of them which were never released. And this is a huge indictment, in my view, of, of uh, our earlier program, because that was enormous amounts of money that were wasted because we failed to understand the biology of these beetles sufficiently to enable us to uh, establish them well in the field or establish them in the field. Um, so, um, again, in 1992 to 95, there was another um, um, program which brought in an, another four species, um, one of which was released and, one of, and three of which were never released uh, again because of the failure to uh, breed them properly. Now, in the first, um, you can see Vaca in up, it was one of those that was released first up. And uh, in the second attempt, a thing called Bubalis was brought in. Now, these are both spring active species, and they are the key species um, 
which are, we are currently involved with. Um, and th that was a um, project which was funded uh, by Meat and Livestock, amongst other people, from 2012 to the current day. Um, so when these species were brought in, they were um, reared in a laboratory in Canberra, and then they were released into the field. And over um, a couple of decades, or sometimes 30 or 40 years, they spread to the natural limits of their distribution. So you can see that on the left, there's a summer active species, summer rainfall species called Gazella, which comes from South Africa for obviously obvious reasons. Um, and uh, that's the natural limits to its distribution. So although we brought, brought it into southern Australia, into Victoria, South Australia and Western Australia and released thousands of them, they've never managed to establish and they, they will never establish. Similarly with the uh, species on the right, Taurus, now, Taurus is a, a great species, uh, but it's only active during middle of summer, highly active during the middle of summer. But that's, the, again, the natural limits of its distribution. So, um, you, you know, you can take Taurus up into Queensland and it'll just fail. Um, so there are different species for different regions. Um, and so what happened when we introduced these dung beetles? The... Um, we uh, introduced them to Australia. Here's a picture of what happens with bison. After five days, there was a whole heap of subsoil. Bison buries the dung at about half a, half a metre, 40 to 60 centimetres. So um, in any duplex soil, you can see this is, this is my uh, front lawn, actually. Um, so I've got a grey sandy loam over a yellow, yellow subsoil, and it's bringing the yellow subsoil. And after two weeks, there's nothing left. Even after a week, really, there's nothing left. Um, uh, when you've got good, good dung beetle populations. So you can see the number of dung beetles that went in. I don't know, probably about a dozen or so, and that's what they achieved. So um, in Australia, um, as I've sort of intimated, um, we've got uh, dung beetles, and in your, um, so your situations um, in, you know, going from one end of your... Uh, CMAs to the other, you, you will have summer beetles, you will um, have in some places have winter beetles, um, very, very few autumn beetles and very few spring beetles. So um, I don't know if any of you want to comment on what you've got on your properties, but I would expect that you uh, see very uh, substantial summer activity in, in um, December, January and they're virtually wiping out the dung pads. Is it, uh, any comments on that, Lowy? Not yet. But no, okay. Come. Right, well, I'll, I'll keep we'll, going then. Yeah. So, um, Ben Hall. Ben Hall is a, um, he is a, um, a notorious criminal, actually. <laughs> People might not be noticing what he's talking about. <laughs> oh, Ben Hall is waiting in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Ben. I presume you are related to that notorious ancestor of yours. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, the bush fly, so uh, various uh, benefits uh, of the dung beetles. Um, um, and one of them is, is, is biological control of the bush fly in southern Australia. So the bush fly overwinters in southeastern Queensland and in uh, um, you know, Western Australia, and each spring it gets carried south on the prevailing winds, and then be, it used to become a huge pest, um, but now it, uh, go, and it, it goes extinct every winter, and then they get reinvaded, the Southern Australia gets reinvaded on the prevailing winds um, again each spring, spring to early summer. So um, when we introduced the, bush, the dunk summer active dung beetles, the fly control was a major success. Now, you, many of you, uh, the older members of, the, of our uh, uh, audience, uh, they may remember the Australian salute. The, um, well, that's a thing of the past in many places, um, especially in midsummer. You know, here in, in the Adelaide Hills, there used to be thousands. I'll, show, I'll, I'll go to the next slide. See here, the, the one on the backpack on the right, that's, that's here in the Adelaide Hills in the 1960s. Um, thousands of flies every year. 
and now you know we would ha I wouldn't see probably half a dozen flies in the whole summer. So they were a big problem. Um, then we introduced the summer beetles, and uh, they they um, effectively controlled the summer breeding, but not the spring breeding. So we needed more spring beetles. The way in which the uh, beetles do this is that uh, the the adult beetles feed on the dung juices, and so do the fly maggots. So when the fly maggots, um, um, the, the, if you get a couple of thousand taurus, for instance, in a dung pad, it dries out the pad in a, in a day, if that, or even faster. But um, the maggots require four days in order to, of feeding on dung juices in order to mature. And so they are virtually den denied their um, food supply. And so they uh, fail. So that's how it works. Um, and... But uh, during spring, like I say, there, we, needed, we need more spring beetles. So um, we also need them for autumn in some places. So um, the bushflies are very dependent upon um, dung quality. So uh, if you get an early break to the season and the dung, then the, you get green pasture, then the autumn uh, dung is also favourable for the fly population. And it can, they, they can build up then as well because we have very few autumn in most places, in Tasmania, we've got autumn dung beetles and in parts of, um, you know, like Braidwood in New South Wales, we've got them. But, um, and, but, um, and we're trying to introduce them into Victoria, but the autumn ones are not doing very well in many places. But um, <clears throat> now we have spring beetles and we brought them in from uh, Europe. So we've had a, a recent national project um, funded by CSIRO and um, Meat and Livestock Australia. And uh, we brought in, in the early phases, we brought in uh, two new species like Vaca and Bubalis, of which I've spoken a little bit earlier. And then we've got this new project, um, which is a, a huge project, actually, $23 million project to, to do a lot more. And it would distribute Vaca and Bubalis across southern Australia and introduce three or more new species. We've actually had a bit of a glitch in that regard because the um, corona, we were due um, four months ago to bring in um, a, a couple of European, uh, well, actually we caught them in Morocco, but we've got our labs in Montpellier in France, and they were to be introduced to the Australian um, quarantine facilities in CSIRO Canberra. A, um, a couple of months ago, but um, the t oh, about half six days before they were due to be sent out, um, the uh, everything got locked down, and so we will probably be delayed introducing those species for a year. So that's quite a um, quite a, um, a serious thing. But anyway, we have to cope with that. So uh, at the moment now we're focusing on vaca and bubalis, and I'll be talking primarily now about vaca. Um, so. Why choose vaca? Well, for bush fly control in spring, but they also uh, bury a lot of dung, so that improves soil health, which improves pasture growth. And um, really importantly, for sheep and cattle and horses, um, they will achieve biological control of gut parasites. So uh, in the next, so here we have um, examples of what happens. So of what happened in 2012, we brought the beetles in from France. Then they went to CSIRO in Canberra. And um, in two years later, um, a chap called Greg Dalton and myself got uh, 75 beetles that we had at Strathalbyn. Um, and we managed to turn them into 17 to 13,000 beetles in 2017. And last um, spring, um, 20,000 of these were um, used by uh, this new project, the Dung Beetle Echo. Dung beetle ecological engineers were used by this new program to start um, farmer nurseries across southern Australia. So that, that's what I'll be dealing with now. So um, here is um, vaca. This is on, this is a spring active vaca. On the left, you see its a distribution in Europe. And on the right, you can see distribute predict, predicted distribution in Australia. So you can see that you guys are pretty much in a fairly favourable kind of zone, the red being the most favourable. So you guys are pretty much in a favourable zone for vaca, as, as are we in, in, in Adelaide.
Uh, here is just an acknowledgement of the various uh, components of the uh, various partners of the project um, and the aims of the project were to do a whole lot of things, but um, primarily what I'm going to talk to now is the one in red, which is to encourage the establishment of um, farmer nurseries across southern Australia to uh, produce a lead rearing and distribution of two recently imported dung beetles. So that's that's what we're talking about now. So now my job in this new uh, big project, what's well, been going for a couple of years now, is I'm, I'm, I'm in charge of theme three, which is beetle distribution. Um, so, um, and my brief is to distribute VACA to over 100 new, new relevant sites across southern Australia. And so that's what um, I'm going to be talking about now, the way in which we've started doing that. And you can see here some pictures. That's a picture of VACA on the right. And it's a medium, small to medium sized beetle. And here is uh, some the farmer nursery business that we'll be, I will be talking about in a moment. Um, so there we are. There's just a big slide. Now, um, on each um, each farmer, each collaborating farmer, it doesn't cost them anything, or won't, doesn't cost you anything, and um, we, we supply everything. Um, but you do have to supply, the farmers need to supply labour and uh, um, to, to monitor it because it's, I, I, you know, I've got a very limited budget and I've got 30 uh, locations across southern Australia. And if I were to employ technicians to service them all, it would be a huge project. So we are very much reliant upon uh, the willing and uh, very competent, actually, um, very competent um, support from uh, the um, collaborating farmers. So we have three things. One is an on-ground cage, which you can see there, in which we put 50 beetles. This thing on the, in the middle is called an arena. We put 100 beetles in that. And on the right, we have these um, cores. So these are soil cores. Um, and on we put um, some dung and 10 beetles in each. And the, the reason for that is that we want to monitor the rate at which the, the beetles develop in the field. And you'll see how important that is in a minute. Um, so um, we, we, I've established them in five different states on 17 cattle properties, three sheep properties and two horse properties. And um, there's our, our dog, Buffy, um, with uh, Adam Tran, one of the collaborators uh, down in Gippsland. Um, and um, in the next one here, so we put these cores into the ground and then after eight and 12 weeks, we pull them up and have a look at what's present. And in some situations, they're all larvae, and in other situations, they're all adults. So uh, it tells us how quickly they are developing and when we can expect the adults to emerge. Um, so um, the egg to adult um, time, um, and in northern, northern districts where it's warm, it took about 10 weeks. Strathalbyn, it took 12 weeks. Portland and Victoria, it took 16 weeks. And actually, I haven't included northern Tasmania, but in northern Tasmania it took about 20 weeks. So um, that means that um, in northern New South Wales, where we expect the beetles will establish, you know, they come out in uh, spring in about, say, August, September, and then, you know, be well before Christmas, they're adults. Whereas in um, Portland and in northern Tasmania, we have to wait until um, late summer before they uh, turn into adults. So, you know, it's very important to know the uh, rate of development so that we can manage the uh, field populations. So this is just um, an example of what might happen. So if you um, get a tenfold increase, then we start with 170 and we end up with 17,000 um, in December 2020. Um, <clears throat> so that's this year. Um, so um, what, what has happened is the outcomes of this um, project is that we have, we have now data on the generational multiplication 
uh, in the field. So, you know, we put in 50 beetles into one of the cages and if we get um, 250 beetles out, as we commonly do, then we know there's been a fivefold. Or if we get 500 out, we know there's been a tenfold increase in uh, survival. Um, we have done moderately well, we've, you know, but um, uh, this guy, um, Strathalbyn, this fellow, um, Greg Dalton, uh, he's done. He's been doing it as well, and he's he's had terrific results. Um, but I'll talk about that later, perhaps. Um, so we get we get the level of survival, um, and we also get an idea of the environmental requirements of the beetles. And then it um, so you know in some situations they do really well, and in other situations they do poorly. Um, and so we can then choose to release the next lot of beetles into a favourable environment. It also provides a model for the establishment um, of further species, you know, these new species that we're planning to bring in. And um, we are hoping that there will be lots of beetles available over the next few years for new colonies of the current species and of new species. Um, so um, how, how can a farmer, how can producers become involved? Well, you can register, you can send us, you can go to our website, Dung, Dung Beetle Solutions International, and um, you can um, register as a potential farmer collaborator for this spring. We're having a meeting in, in uh, 10 days time to, to work out how many beetles we're going to have available for establishing farmer nurseries. But there's not going to be all that many in this spring. But next spring, uh, I expect there will be much larger numbers. And then uh, after the project finishes, um, I expect there will be widespread distribution through Creation Care. Uh, in, that's the uh, Greg Dalton's uh, company uh, in, based in, in Strathalbyn in South Australia. And he, he's, mass, he's mass rearing them for uh, widespread distribution and he's doing very well. So... Um, so um, the sorts of activities that um, you as farmers can become, uh, as producers can become involved in, is the farmer nurseries, which I've explained a little bit about. But you can also be involved in monitoring the beetles and monitoring dung burial. Now, um, the d monitoring dung burial hasn't been done all that much, but in my view, it's an absolutely essential thing. I mean, what we're interested in is the effect of the dung beetles on dung burial. Not so much the, you know, it doesn't matter if you've got five or 50 beetles, if they do the same job, then that's what you're interested in, um, dung burial. So uh, it's my uh, considered opinion that we need to uh, focus on dung burial as much as we need to focus on beetle numbers. But the trapping, of course, of beetles is much easier than the measurement of uh, dung burial. Um, and there's a, the reason for this uh, regular trapping is that we want to define the uh, seasonal activity of beetles uh, throughout uh, the year, of course, seasonal activity in, in different regions. So if, for, for instance, um, you have in your area, you were to do some beetle trapping in your area, then, um, and we showed that there was a very sharp decline in beetle activity in uh, February, which I expect would probably be the case, uh, and then nothing much until February, March, April, May, um, then that clearly defines a seasonal gap. And then we can go to Europe and Southern Africa, uh, where, which are ho similar climates, they call them homoclimatic regions, um, similar climate, and uh, identify additional species for introduction. So that's why the, the monitoring is important. So, um, of course, you will all be wondering, well, you know, what happens if we introduce some dung beetles to our place? Well, it doesn't happen overnight, unfortunately. I wish it did, but it doesn't. Um, so we, um, for instance, with bison here, Bubis bison, a winter, this is the winter active beetle. Uh, on the Fluria, there were none present um, at the turn of the century. Um, and in uh, to, you know, over a couple of years, we introduced 30 colonies and then um, we surveyed them in winter, uh, four years later, three or four years later, and then again, um, eight years later, and then um, identified a couple of gaps 
and um, so in this next, and then we did some more surveying. So uh, what happened was that the uh, the Beatles, um, they were, although they were released in two thousand and two and two thousand and three, after three and four years they had established, but they had not spread very far. So they were uh, present in low numbers in isolated pockets, and that's un that's uh, still after three or four years. Then in winter two thousand and fifteen we did another survey. And we found that the beetle had spread wide, it would have become widespread. It still wasn't extremely abundant, but um, it was widespread except in two regional areas, which we identified. And so um, we released that next two years later, we released beetles into those areas. And then we surveyed them the following year. And we found that they had all, all established. All, all of the releases that we, we put out ha had established because um, we now know more about how to do it and make sure it works. So here are a few pictures of, of what we did. Um, you can see here on the, this was in a sandy, this was a sandy soil over a, a clay subsoil. So you can see this, these, this five up in the top left hand corner, there are five piles of uh, soil and they've each been brought to the surface by the beetles tunneling underneath the dung pad. When you have a look underneath the dung pad, you see that there are a series of holes about the size of your little finger, or depending how big your little finger is actually. And these tunnels, um, although you, you, you can see the tunnel on the uh, lower, you can see the tunnel going right down now. Um, and then when you dig it up, you find that there's a, a, a mass of uh, dung down at about half a meter. And when you open it up, like you can see um, here, uh, there is an egg inside it. So that's that's what happened with the survey of winter 2018. So um, we found that the beetles were widespread and they had established and they were breeding. So that was a, a successful uh, e exercise. But it, what it points to is the, the need to survey and uh, monitor and um, fill the gaps. So that's what we did. We introduced them. We established uh, the beetles, then we measured how quickly they had established, and but it took 20 years, you know, or 15 to 20 years to do it. So it's not a, not a short term thing, but it's um, very, very beneficial, of course. So another thing we found was that it was much better to release 2,000 and 1,000 beetles. Where we released 1,000 beetles, we got a six-fold increase in population. Where we released 2,000, we got a 19-fold increase. So they were much, much more successful when we released more of them. So that, that also is a very important piece of information. So now we're getting on to... Some questions. I've got a couple of questions. Oh, okay, here. sure, a couple of questions. Um, Darren asks, how far can beetles travel by flight? Darren, okay, how far do they fly? can they fly? Well, it depends very much upon the environment in which they find themselves. If they're in a paddock uh, with lots of cattle and lots of dung, um, they will fly to the nearest dung pad, which, only, which might be a couple of metres away. If, however, um, they are in a situation uh, where dung is in short supply, for instance, down in the southeast, I established some southeast of South Australia near a place called Bull Lagoon, magnificent spot for this winter active beetle bison. Uh, and there was a, a property there in the middle of a cropping zone, and um, we released um, we released the beetles um, in there, and they established very quickly because we released large numbers. We released four or five thousand into this one property, and um, within a couple of few years, they had built up to large numbers, and then um, uh, three or four kilometres away across the the cropping zone, the beetles started appearing in the uh, in the dung, um, or in cattle dung, um, three or four kilometres away. So the, the beetles had clearly built up to a sufficient number and then they had flown. Once they got onto the cropping land, of course, there was nothing to um, lure them down to the ground. So they just kept flying. So, um, you know, in favourable situations, they might fly only a few metres, but they're quite capable of flying, you know, three or four uh, kilometres uh, if, if there's no dung in between. Okay, so um, 
Tracy was asking how can tr groups get involved, and you talked about that. Um, yeah, well, I think, Tracy, the best way to do it is to send us an email. Of course, we can't, you know, we want, um, yeah, we, we, we need collaborators. And um, so um, if you, you send us an email or and anybody else, send us an email, but also tell us a little bit about your place, say whether or not how many cattle you run, and particularly soil type, I'm very interested in the uh, effects of soil type on beetle populations. And uh, we'll see see how we can um, um, fit you into the program if it's possible, you know. Not everybody can be part of it, of course. And I've put Bernard's contact Thanks. details in the chat, but we'll also show a slide at the end. So um, Darren says, how do farmers identify what beetles they already have on their property? Well, um, to identify the beetles that you have on your place, you first of all, of course, have to go and get them and have a look at them. And, uh, and the best way to do that probably is to um, go out into the paddock uh, with a, a bucket of water or, you know, a bucket and go near a water trough and put, um, you know, two thirds of a bucket of water in there and find a dung pad that's about two days old and you have to sneak up on it because the, the, the uh, beetles are uh, very, very sensitive to uh, vibration. And if you, if you bang the soil, for instance, they will run down their tunnels and you won't get them. But so slip a, uh, a, a shovel underneath this dung pad and <clears throat> then um, taking a couple of centimetres of soil, perhaps, or one centimetre of soil, and then put it into the into the bucket and the beetle stir it and the beetles will float that and they'll come to the surface very quickly and then you can then you've got your beetles so once you've got your beetle well what species is it well there is the csiro um, um booklet but it you know e but even with sort of tw there are 23 introduced species and a whole and you know half a dozen or a dozen native species so you know yeah, and of course, for the inexperienced person, it's a bit hard to, you know, you've got a small black beetle, but what the hell is it? Um, so, um, allowing that, um, I really should get that um, Belinda, um, Belinda Pierce, a, a very competent person in um, northeastern Victoria, put together a, a, a much more friendly uh, key, um, you know, based upon size and colour. Um, and you can use that. Um, we'll, we'll see if we can make that available. But the other thing you can do is um, photograph the beetle and, uh, and send it to me uh, by email and I will identify it for you. Or, and so um, you, can, you can find out. But what you will find uh, primarily is that you've got um, three, probably, maybe four, five uh, summer species. You'll have a little black one with big horns called Taurus. You'll have a a uh, brownie one called Fullness, and a, a little a little one with orange wing covers called Fimitarius, and <clears throat> a couple of others. Um, and you may have autumn and spring beetles, but you won't have many of them. Um, and they would probably be natives. And then you'll have a winter beetle, um, or you may or may not have the winter beetle. So um, what you need to do in order to know what you've got present is to go out and catch them first. And the bucket system's not a bad way of doing that. Then you uh, have a good look at them and uh, perhaps get the CSIRO uh, um, dung beetle field guide. And then, and also you may, if you wish, photograph them and send the photographs to me, or you can even send me the specimens. But I'd prefer, you know, I get a few specimens, so I'd prefer just to look at photographs first. Uh, you have to try and get the front end of the beetle and the top of the beetle best. Uh, to make make sure that uh, I, I've got the characters that I need to identify. Um, so that's about it, I would say. So Darren makes a comment. Uh, not Darren, I mean Dean, I'm sorry. Um, he says, our bison beetles have turned up on our, on our neighbours, maybe one to or two kilometres south of us. This is within 12 months. So do oh. people hear that? Well, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Um, Dean. Uh, Dean, uh, I'd like to know how uh, how many were 
released on the original property. What can happen, of course, is that if you put them in, you release them onto a property and then you move the cattle or uh, then the beetles fly and um, they, um, you know, they fly until they find done. And so that's very a very interesting thing to, to hear that they have um, um, turned up a, a kilometre away. Um, it's certainly true. A mate of mine on Kangaroo Island uh, has 2,800 acres and he runs it as, a, as two, two cartwheels on, on a cell grazing system. And so the cattle are in these large paddocks for only a day and then they move on. So it may be two or three days before um, or four days before the beetles have finished their work and want to move on to the uh, next uh, dung source. And over that uh, three or four days, the cattle could be moved, you know, half a kilometre or a kilometre away. So, and very clearly in that situation, the beetles uh, find the dung because he's got huge populations. So um, <laughs> they're quite, you know, they're quite capable of, of finding that. Okay. Um, there's a couple more that I'll... Um hold off on but just to finish Dean's we'll yeah. go back to the others later um he says that we reply we supplied him with a thousand a year ago I thought you might be that Dean, <laughs> Dean. anyway hello but Dean then he says how do we get them to come home <laughs> um, we so, have to, <laughs> home. yeah you have to um, you have to train them mate it's a matter of uh, getting into their psyche and teaching them a, you know like a bloody homing pigeon <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, Wendy says that Lockington Land Care in, uh, released 14,000 beetles last December. I'll go on now. Um, so now I'm going to talk a bit about gut parasite control. Um, so we are now sort of getting into, uh, getting away from um, what uh, you guys can do, perhaps, um, to some extent any rate, and um, talking about the benefits of the of the dung beetles okay so um in pre-war agriculture of course there were no chemicals available and and yet uh, parasites were under quite good control and that's because of natural immunity in the stock but it, you know, in recent times a whole heap of things like antibiotics vaccines chemicals um have, have arrived on the scene and um out for you. <laughs> Loeen had a look at this last night and she's taken out a particular slide what? that I thought was coming up. The uh, one with um, uh, showing that, you know, the book by um, that fellow in Mel in Sydney. No. Anyway, really? go on. Go okay. On. Go on. Um, okay, so uh, gut worms. Um, this is the uh, the life cycle of the uh, gut, gut worms. Uh, that the eggs go out, you, you all know this, I'm sure, that the eggs go out in the dung and the eggs hatch into the larvae. In the dung, there's three larval stages and, and two larval stages in the host. So in the, uh, the, the, uh, the early instar larvae, the one and first and second instar larvae, the first and second stages after hatching, they feed on the uh, bacterial uh, soup in the, in the dung like in the same way as the uh, fly maggots and the adult dung beetles do. Like I was explaining to you earlier that the, the uh, uh, bush fly uh, becomes scarce because it doesn't, it can't compete with the dung beetles for, um, for the dung juices because the, the uh, activities of things like uh, taurus, on top of this taurus, dry up the dung pads in a few days and so the, there is no food for them. In the same way, the same thing can happen for the, the larvae, uh, the first and second instar larvae of the, of the flies, of the uh, parasites. But there are various ways of controlling your gut worms, as you can see here, um, drenches and chemicals. But natural immunity is really important. Pasture spelling uh, used to be favourable. I, I think it's, a, it's very difficult to use pasture spelling effectively. Cross-grazing, dung beetles and pathogens. So um, here we come to now, uh, drenches and pastes. Um, so um, the mectins, you know, ivermectin, doramectin, aprinomectin, moxidectin, um, most of those, uh, the first three of those, uh, kill dung beetles. Um, whereas there is one dung beetle friendly 
uh, mectin, you know, the uh, ivermectin, they um, called moxidectin. And for uh, cattle, it's available as um, uh, cydectin, or for horses, it's available as Equest or Equest Plus. plus. And for sheep, it's available as cydectin or, and, and as moximax for cattle. So, um, and the white, there are also other uh, things like the white drenches and the clear drenches, but these, um, um, the, especially in sheep, the uh, extremely high level of, of resistance in, the, in sheep uh, to these, um, the white and the clear drenches. So, um, you, you know, um, it, they're not very effective at all in controlling the gut worms. Um, and it's, um, but they don't kill, they don't kill the dung beetles. So they're, although they're not very effective in some situations, they are, but mostly they're not effective in, in controlling the gut worms, but they don't damage the dung beetles. So um, in, in summary, you've got the uh, mectins, most of them, um, and you want to be a bit careful. Some of them, um, <clears throat> claim to be dung beetle friendly, but in my view, they are not. Um, so um, with, with the mectins, uh, if you, uh, you can either use the toxic chemicals at times of year when there are no dung beetles about, that's of course a safe time to use it, um, and, um, or you can use uh, <coughs> moxidectin. But I also think that it's a very wise thing to, to only uh, treat very sporadically. Um, so now we're going to um, <clears throat> natural immunity, of course, is a very important thing. So if you wipe um, uh, over millions of years, there has been coevolution between the parasite and the host. And so the um, parasites <clears throat> um, are effectively controlled in many situations by, uh, in healthy animals by the uh, immune response in the, in the host animal. And you need low numbers of parasites to be present in order to stimulate that resistance. And if you have, if you use chemicals to wipe out your parasites, then you get no more stimulation of the uh, immunological capacity to resist the um, the parasites. And so uh, you're back onto the chemical bandwagon. But of course, uh, there are exceptions, and the the young, the sick, the lame, and the old, you know, people like us. Um, <clears throat> so how do you decide what, um, what you need? Well, you, the best thing to do is do fecal egg counts, but of course, <clears throat> the condition of your animals, you know, obviously, um, you know, not in your area, but, um, you know, say barber's pole worm can be a really severe problem in sheep. And, um, you know, you have to get onto that straight away. And, you know, uh, the, the farmers, you know, the, the producers recognise uh, when, when the animals are not looking at all well. But, you, you know, the, uh, the real thing is to, um, if you can, use faecal egg counts to identify when you treat your stock. So um, pasture spelling is another way of going. And in summer, of course, the... Um, it still takes the larvae in, in the dung pad. You remember how I said that the, the eggs hatch into uh, first instar larvae and then second instar larvae, and those first two feed on the bacterial soup in the dung. Well, they take about a week to do that, but in, in winter, of course, they take many weeks. So that means that they're vulnerable in summer, they're vulnerable to beetle attack for only a couple, only a week, but in winter, any beetle attack which uh, uh, happens over the first three weeks. So things like bison, they will, you know, you might, if you have small numbers of bison, then, um, well, put it another way, if you have large numbers of bison, they can bury a dung pad within a couple of days, like, like you saw in that picture of, a, of Australia on our front lawn here, um, you know, within a fortnight, everything, within a week, virtually everything is gone. Whereas if you have low numbers, um, say three or two or three pairs in a big dung pad, then they can take um, three weeks to bury most of the dung. But because in winter, uh, the uh, larvae, are, they don't leave the pad for many weeks, they're still vulnerable to attack 
you know, a three-week-old pad can still have um, larvae present in it, and um, and yet the dung beetle activity in burying that dung and changing its consistency and moisture levels uh, make make it unfavourable and so damage the populations of the um, parasites in, in the field. So um, another way of uh, controlling your parasites is by cross-grazing. So the, um, the parasites, were primarily the parasites in cattle, are not the same as those in sheep and they are different again from those in horses. So if a, uh, if a sheep parasite is eaten by a cow, then in most situations it fails to mature. It just dies inside the cow. So it's a way, so cross-grazing using uh, multiple species is a way of controlling your, your uh, worm populations. Um, so um, the way in which the dung beetles control worms is uh, by um, drying out the pad, like I was saying, um, but uh, drying out the surface pad. But when, when the dung beetles, the adult dung beetles bury the dung, they also suck out, they feed on the juices that uh, are in the dung that they bury. And so the, the um, brood mass, the buried dung at say half a meter is relatively dry. Um, to, it's dry to the touch, dry-ish to the touch. It's certainly nothing, there's no very little dung fluid. And so uh, the, uh, the, the buried dung is also in an unfavorable environment for the, uh, for the fly, for the worm larvae, for the gut worm larvae. The, this, was, this has not been studied in great detail, but um, in, in northern New South Wales, um, Jenny Coldham, a few years ago, as part of the Dung Beetle Express, did a trial in which she had a surface dung, and then she manually buried a dung that uh, was infected with a larvae, and, um, and she got the dung to be buried by beetles. And in the surface dung, they got many uh, infective larvae coming out. In the manually buried one, they got even more because the... Uh, the moisture uh, conditions underground were highly favourable for the um, worm, worm larvae, but when it was buried by the beetle, none came out. So that that is a, it's a very small trial. It's only with one one species of parasite. It's only in one environment. It's only uh, with one species of dung, and it's only at one time of year. But um, uh, this this area needs a lot more work. So is there any questions about gut no, control? No, no? Moment, okay. They might come. All right. So um, a reminder to fill out the survey, please, people, when you leave the webinar. Okay. Um, so now I'm just going to briefly uh, look at the, um, the sort of benefits. Uh, Can I just alert mm -hmm. you that it's now 11.30? Ask Darren about timing. Oh, okay. Um, so how much more time have I got, Darren? Um, just, just keep going, Brad. Okay. Um, I've, I've probably got another 20 minutes, 15 minutes, something like that. Okay. So um, production benefits. So uh, earthworms. Um, the earthworms feed upon uh, the, uh, the buried dung, and so um, in, and they follow the tunnels down to the ground. So the... Um, you can see on the top left-hand corner, that's a, a, an introduced earthworm down at 50 centimetres. And um, on the opposite side, you can see the uh, earthworm casts uh, in the tunnel. So the, the tunnels are usually lined with dung. And so the earthworms feed on the, on the dung, dung lining the tunnels. And as they go down deep into the soil, they crack into the tunnels. And so the tunnels get... Um, the heaps of earthworm casts, which of course, as we all know, are highly nutritious. And this causes the um, pasture roots to grow down the tunnels. And you can see in the lower left-hand side, the, the stain, the black stain is the, is the tunnel lining that has been eaten off by, uh, the, by the earthworms. And you can see the roots growing down there. And on the other side, you can see where, the, where there are um, buried dung, be, dung buried by beetles. There's a vastly more root uh, mass down there than there is in the control one, which is on the far right. Um, 
They also, um, the tunnels, um, also provide uh, a mechanism for water infiltration. So you can see here, um, there is a, um, uh, a pad which has just been, the, the top of it's been scooped off and you can see, you know, perhaps 50 tunnels there, something like that. Underneath that with the two forks, that's a very unusual situation, but you can see there was a very large dung pad in the middle. This is after 24 hours. So um, it's an amazing situation, actually. Um, so those, this is at Bull Lagoon. What happens when the beetles first come out is that they, they, fit, they go down to about, they dig a tunnel to about 10 centimetres and they take a little bit of dung down there. And then when they're ready to, um, when they're fed on that dung, they move sideways. So if you are trying to collect dung beetles, then the best place to collect them is in the uh, sort of, in little patches around the perimeter of the pad, because they all, for some crazy reason, they all move sideways. But when you have a very, very large number of beetles present, uh, as there was in this case, and you can see that there's nothing left of that dung pad after 24 hours, um, the, the beetles uh, kept moving sideways. And so there were, there were 600, and, there about 600, over six to 700 exit tunnels um, about, um, you know, within a metre of the dung pad. So the beetles had gone down, fed a bit, moved, got really crowded, mo kept moving sideways, and then come up the next night. What this means is that that entire area of um, about, you know, several square metres has essentially been ploughed by the, by, by the dung, by this one uh, colony of dung beetles, probably a thousand or 1500 dung beetles went into that pad. And that's natural, you know, natural, that's what happened in the field. Um, and if you were to go and pour a, a bucket of water onto that soil, it would, you just, it would just disappear, you'd never see it. Uh, the way we measure it on the, on the right, you can see here, uh, we use these um, cores, uh, PVC cores punched into the soil, and we put in 50 millimetres of uh, water and uh, see how long it takes to um, soak in. There, that's our daughter, Pippa, and that's the legs of her ex-boyfriend. Um, now, in the next one, um, what will the effect of all that, it, with all of that... Um, carrying of the uh, dung down below and the nutrients that are carried down with the is the is a substantial increase in pasture production so here you can see the effect uh, in this particular occasion dung only had no effect it depends when you put the dung out you know if if the dung this was in, this was done in set up in um, spring on the on the 1st of september and it was fairly dry and so none of the, uh, and there wasn't much rain. And so the, the dung juices from the dung weren't wa washed into the, into the soil. But, you know, we all know that uh, when you see dung pads, unburied dung pads, there's a big growth of uh, grass around them. Well, that wouldn't have happened in this case. But if, the, if we'd done the experiment earlier in the season, then the, um, some of the nutrients from the dung pad would have been washed into the soil by the rain. And so the, you would have had more growth in the dung only treatment than you did have in the control treatments. But at any rate, the point is that um, the dung plus beetles produced a very substantial increase in, uh, in pasture growth. And this is um, tons of dry matter per year uh, on there, per hectare. On there. So um, the dung beetles can produce a very substantial uh, increase in pasture productivity. Um, and of course, the other thing that it does do is when you get the water going into the ground instead of running off it, um, that you don't get um, polluted water running into your waterways and things like that. So we have a couple comments from Wendy. Yeah. She says that Lockington Landcare also expects to release uh, 16,000 winter beetles in the next month. Oh. And Lockington is west of Echuca in Victoria. West of Echuca, what's the rain for? Perhaps you and Wendy need to have a chat afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So biochar 
uh, was first discovered in, um, in, by people flying over the Amazon and seeing patches of, of bright uh, green vegetation uh, next to yellowish vegetation, when they went and investigated it, they found that although the soil composition was very similar in these in, in adjacent areas, there was a huge amount of charcoal um, or biochar, as they call it. They called it terra preta or dark earth uh, in the um, in the places where there were these green patches, and these these were the um, places where the um, first people of, of South America were um, producing their, were, were, were burning their, um, you know, their fires and putting charcoal into the soil. Now, this stuff is really, so, and you can see there, that's the um, comparison in the uh, corn yields in, in a with and without biochar system. So there are various ways of producing. Biochar really is just um, charcoal, uh, but it can have a whole series of different qualities depending upon uh, what you make it from and um, and how hot you make it so if you make it from chicken uh, from chicken um, litter for instance at a low temperature then it will have um, a, um, a high nutrient content and so you'll get a pasture growth response and um, but it will only, uh, it won't last anywhere near as long as the other. It'll only last a couple of thousand years. Um, whereas if you uh, make it from, um, say, wood chips uh, or, J say, Jarrah Jarrah wood chips, you know, uh, and, and at a really high temperature, then uh, it's an extremely stable thing which will last for tens of thousands of years, but it won't have the same nutrient uh, qualities, although it will have the capacity to improve um the structure of soils and um, various other things. Um, so there are various ways of making it. You can see up here that people are making it using a 44 gallon drum in, or there's a, um, the, the lower left is, is called the Contiki, uh, that biochar kiln, it's a sort of, you can buy it commercially um, and uh, you can make your own biochar. Um, and then there are big biochar uh, factories like this one in uh, New South Wales. Um, and of course, they produce thousands of, uh, of tons of biochar a year. Um, the, um, this particular uh, biochar factory, um, when the biochar is, what happens is you, you heat um, organic matter. Um, and then it uh, releases methane and carbon monoxide. Now, both of these are flammable gases. So um, um, if you collect the gas that comes off uh, a biochar kiln, then um, you can use that to power turbines and things like that. Uh, but in this, um, but the, the gas that comes out from, from a biochar system is, has got tars in it small amount of tar so it needs to be scrubbed it needs to be purified but in this particular biochar factory uh, the um, continuous biochar converter as they call it um, it produces um, uh, enough gas to um, run turbines that um, pr produce sufficient electricity for the um, for the factory itself and also it's fed into the grid for the to the local town so it's a, a very good thing so um you can also feed biochar to cattle um this is um in western australia um a chap called doug powell um, uh, pioneered this um a few years ago perhaps 10 years ago <coughs> and he's been feeding biochar um, to his cattle for ages, and he gets a really, uh, he, you know, great productivity. And of course, when the cattle produce their dung, um, the dung gets buried by the uh, by the dung beetles, and so uh, it's a way of improving uh, the uh, carbon content of your soils. So there, are, um, with with biochar. It, it does a number of things. So one of the things it does is uh, improve the 
um, improve the um, digestive efficiency of the cattle. So um, I've done experiments using biochar, uh, looking at to see how much the uh, biochar uh, inoculated dung improved pasture production. Well, in this particular experiment that I did, it didn't improve pasture production, but um, it, it, what, it re what it did do was change the digestive physiology of the cattle so that the, the cattle that were producing the uh, biochar effect uh, in, uh, inoculated dung, they, uh, within a couple of days, they, they were um, sort of medium-sized calves and uh, we were feeding them a bit of grain and um, some chaff and stuff like that. And they, of course, cattle in, on that sort of diet produced terribly unpleasant, stinky kind of dung. Well, within a day or so of feeding them the biochar, the dung were, came out with be smelling beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened was that they, it had changed the digestive physiology of the beetles. Now, oh, the oh sorry, the cattle. <laughs> and... Um, so um, some data I haven't, I, I probably should have put it in here, but I thought I was going to go on. Uh, this has probably gone on too long already. But um, there's been some experiments that, which have shown that the um, use of biochar in cat, feeding them to cattle uh, has done a number of things. First of all, it's increased the, the weight gain of the cattle, but it's also reduced the amount of methane that produced a 45% increase in the 45% uh, decrease in the amount of methane produced by the cattle. So the way I interpret that is that the methane is CH4, so it's a carbon and a hydrogen compound. And um, what I reckon has happened is that the, um, the presence of the charcoal in the gut of the cow has changed the digestive physiology, the composition of the microbes that break down the organic matter and produce energy and methane. Uh, and so the number of methogen, methanogenic um, microbes in the gut are decreased. And so the, the carbon, which was previously going out in uh, methane, uh, it now goes into the uh, tissues of the animal. And so you get... Uh, you get, a no, you get three benefits at least. You get reduced methane production, you get increased pasture production, increased um, animal growth, and you get um, improved um, uh, soil uh, carbon levels because, it, well, if, if you've got dung beetles to bury the dung. So um, that's about it, I'd say. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you found it useful. Um, we might um, address a few more questions if, if you've got them. No more questions? Well, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you found it useful. And um, uh, I look forward to hearing from some of you. Um, thank you. I have, we have a question here. <laughs> so, do the same dung beetles work on both cattle and horse dung from John? Hi, John. Um, yes, they do. Um, mm -hmm. they, they work with, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to see that you didn't put sheep in there. The, uh, the <laughs> summer beetles uh, will bury uh, uh, horse and cattle dung. Um, they'll both breed in it, um, but they won't, they won't bury the pellets that are produced by sheep. In winter, uh, or if the sheep, are, sheep or goats are feeding upon um, green green pick, then the dung that they produce is not pellets, but a kind of a plop and mm -hmm. a larger plop. And that um, it can be, that will be buried by um, all of the, um, the winter and the spring dung beetles. And the, um, the winter and the spring dung beetles will do very well on horse and on cattle dung. So, um, yeah, so the spring beetles and the winter beetles will feed on horse, cattle and sheep dung, whereas the summer beetles will only feed on cattle and horse dung. So Dean says, excellent. Thank you, Bernard. And Tracy says, thank you for this webinar. It was great. And Tess is putting a reminder up for everybody to complete the survey at the end of the webinar. Okay. Well, thanks, Bernard. That was um, an excellent presentation, and thanks.
Laureen for assisting Vernon. Yeah, thank you, Laureen.